All right, well, President Biden taking aim at China this week, warning that its economy is a ticking time bomb. The president pointed to recent challenges, including weak growth as evidence that the Chinese economy is in, quote, trouble. For more on what this means for investors, we want to bring in Martin Schultz. He's Federated Hermes, head of international equity group. Martin, it's great to see you here. So it's no secret that China's recovery has been struggling, to say the least. What does this mean, though, for investors? Is it way too early for investors to write off any investment opportunity within China? Well, Shauna, thanks for having us. Um, so at Federated Hermes here, we've actually been visiting China a lot the last few months. And uh, you're absolutely correct that uh, it's been a really tough road. In fact, I think the one takeaway that we had in our recent visits is that uh, the pessimism is just um, enormous, um, whether it's the consumer investors on the ground, private investors. Um, obviously, the market has been in a tough slide. Economically, you've got property market. You have, again, lack of confidence, again, both on the consumption side as well as on the investment side. And so uh, it's been tough. But uh, we think that um, as of about two or three weeks ago, the government started to really notice um, some of the issues um, that have been out there for us investors for quite some while that indicate that they may actually may be taking some steps right now to change uh, their policy. And that's very, very important because at the end of the day, policy prescriptions in China have been very, very important to the property markets, which then in turn have led to a fairly strong uh, economic situation. And for us, I think um, this contrarian view of being, um, you know, now thinking that China will actually outperform is probably one that we're, we're behind. Yeah, Martin, with that said, I mean, how significant do you think some of these reforms are likely to be? Certainly a lot of focus on the real estate market right now, given where it's been, um, you know, to, to what extent can any of these policies um, be help stimulate the economy? I mean, how big are they likely to be? Well, in the past, they've actually been very big. And I think for the last 10 years, uh, the government has tried to kind of step back. And Akiko, I think that's a very good question, because at the end of the day, um, China is not growing nearly as fast as it once was, as we all know. It is the world's second largest economy. Um, and at, on top of that, um, they've got some demographic headwinds. They have to grow rich before they grow old, and they're growing old very quickly. Um, so the government has a, a bunch of levers, a little less than what they used to. Uh, but on the monetary policy front, they've started to kind of just jiggle a little bit, but they've got the ability there to uh, cut rates, uh, much like some of the other emerging market banks, such as Brazil and other places around the world. They've got that policy flexibility. And then on the property markets, they really can. They just moved some of the goalposts. They, um, for example, uh, during COVID, you had to have an 80 percent cash down payment uh, to get a mortgage. That's now down to 30 to 40 percent. So they do have levers to continue to knock that down. But again, they are dealing with these demographic headwinds. But still, remember that um, it's China is an economy and a nation that is still urbanizing. There are a lot of people um, still moving to the cities. Uh, and so you still have this job creation and this uh, household formation situation that will continue to drive this economy forward. Martin, what do you think is a realistic timeline from an investor's per perspective when you're trying to identify investment opportunities over there? What looks most attractive? How do you view that recovery timeline and what this recovery phase is going to look like? Well, as you know, Sean, it's been very frustrating. Um, we actually started to go even away to China last summer with the expectation that COVID restrictions would be lifted earlier. Um, we also thought that uh, some of the regulatory uh, overhang would go away quicker. That's now starting to happen. But I think in the meantime, obviously, we lost uh, some confidence or investors have lost confidence, if you will. So we believe for the next two to three years, and even from a technical perspective, China looks very, very interesting uh, because it has been in such a funk for such a long time. So we think the next six, six to 12 months, um, and therein lies, from our perspective, really a focus on Internet, commerce, consumption names um, that we like, the Alibabas of the world, if you will, the 10 cents of the world, uh, companies that we think that will generate some really strong earnings going forward. And because the valuations are so low, the expectations are so low that we think they will be able to, out, be able to outperform longer term. Martin, outside of China, you've talked about other opportunities in emerging markets, uh, particularly looking around central bank policy. Uh, I think you're the second or third guest this week to talk about Brazil as a potential opportunity when you consider monetary policy there. But talk about how you're viewing other central banks in this context and where the good investments are. 
Sure. So the emerging markets fronts, you're absolutely right. Brazil is one of the places that we've uh, been overweight for quite some time. Our top-down country allocation process, which we utilize, is basically gets us to focus on those markets that are undervalued and have the least amount of risk. And Brazil fits into that category. And you know, as you know, they've been very using very conventional monetary policy. So they've been ahead of the game, ahead of the Fed, ahead of the ECB. Um, and so they've been really a central bank and uh, you know, obviously political politics aside, um, a market that we think will continue to do well. Um, and those companies that have the ability to uh, leverage, obviously, declining rates are going to win the most. Um, and so, uh, but the, on the other hand, you know, there's been one central bank out there um, in uh, Japan that is really trying to navigate the yield c control uh, curve control situation. And so we think Japan is also a place uh, not obviously in the emerging markets, but one that we think will generate some decent upside returns for investors in, in the next few months and years. Ryan, let's talk about what's going on with oil with crude and not only here in the U.S., but really on a global scale, because the International Energy Agency, the IEA, out earlier today saying that OPEC plus supply cuts, that they could potentially drive oil prices even higher. They went on to say that June was a record month here in terms of world oil demand. We've seen this steady rise in the price of crude up now seven weeks in a row. How are you looking at this just as in terms of a potential headwind to the economic recovery, not only here in the U.S., but also when we talk about China and other areas of the world, the international picture as well? Yeah, Sean, that's a really great question um, because oil at the end of the day for both consumers as well as producers, obviously a tax uh, if it goes up relative to it going down. So uh, we do expect oil to stay stable and potentially rise. Part of that is because we think the global economy uh, is bottoming and starting to grow. And in fact, China thus far has not been a big buyer of oil. I think the biggest issue is that uh, here in the U.S., We've been selling oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Um, and so there is this, if you will, uh, game being played between the oil producers and the U.S. as it relates to oil price. But again, I think if we see um, the U.S. not entering a recession, if the recession in Europe is fairly shallow, as we expect, then we do expect that demand will increase. And, you know, as this ESG or environmental kind of focus in the green world continues, obviously this transition period is going to be very long. Uh, carbon, unfortunately, uh, energy uh, are going to continue to be a big part and a source of energy for the world's economy. And so we think that energy prices will be higher than expected. And what that's going to lead to is particularly in the case of the Fed, that's going to lead to higher inflation rates. And we saw this in the PPI numbers today. Uh, we think that will continue. Um, and so I think uh, investors, on the one hand, they're seeing inflation rates come down pretty quickly, and that's a good sign. But I think it's going to be a little stickier than people expect. And that's probably the one, if you will, risk that we see out there. And again, as, as oil prices remain high, or at least these levels or higher, um, obviously, that, as I mentioned earlier, really is a tax on the average uh, co consumer or, or producer. And so uh, that's something we need to watch out for. And it may mean that rates around the world will remain higher than expected because of that situation. Yeah, that certainly adds to concerns about inflation reaccelerating. So when you're talking about where prices are likely to remain, I mean, the IEA says it could be go it could go even higher in terms of demand this month. Um, is your base case here that they do remain elevated into year end? We do believe that they will remain elevated. Again, partly part of that has to do with the geopolitics and what happened with Saudi Arabia and Russia and some of the other swing producers right now. You know, the problem is the U.S. for many years was that swing producer. But right now, uh, for several reasons, we are not that swing producer to the degree that we were once before in the last several 10, you know, seven, seven, seven 10 years ago. Um, and so... For the near term, we do expect that um, we will see uh, elevated prices at these levels or higher. Martin, when it comes to the U.S. and the readings that we got on inflation this week, we got PPI, the producer price index, this morning coming in hotter than expected. And that contrasts to what we saw yesterday from CPI when, once again, we saw inflation pressures at least easing more than the street had been looking for. What's your read on these two conflicting reports and what that tells us just about the Fed's long fight against inflation and the path forward? Yeah, you're, you're, you're basically highlighting a very uh, interesting uh, phenomenon, which is that um, interest rates are generally coming down much quicker than expected, but it's not a one-way direction, one-way street, so to speak. Obviously, uh, post-COVID and supply chain 
issues that we've had and some of the other uh, machinations within um, the uh, the economy. Um, we do think that inflation is coming down, but it will remain stickier than expected. And so in that vein, again, I think that the central banks, I mean, you look at what's happening in the UK, the Bank of England, uh, either in, in, in Canada uh, and in Australia, they're being much more um, careful about where they take interest rates based on some of these inflation numbers. So um, obviously the risk is that um, higher rates will drive um, uh, the global economy, or in, the, in this case, the U.S. economy into a potential recession. But in the in the near term, I think fighting inflation is going to be the number one uh, task, and that's what they're focused on. So in that debate, Martin, which, which camp are you in? Are you in the camp that, that expects a mild recession at least, given how elevated rates are likely to remain? You know, at Federated Hermes, we were expecting a recession earlier in the year. And I think we've decided that um, because of where we are in the economic cycle and the monetary policy cycle, what we're seeing um, elsewhere, we do think that if we have a uh, recession, it will be not. It will be delayed until much later, probably late 2024. We'll see if that comes to fruition. But right now, the markets are telling us. Again, obviously, at the end of the day, we are seeing some economic data that is very weak. Um, but on the other hand, we're also seeing uh, some other data, both economic as well as market oriented, where we're seeing the market broadening out, and we're seeing a situation which we're getting so far away from um, this. Um, and, and, you know, we, we could be in a very different situation. If you think about monetary policy in the past, usually between nine and 18 months, you saw some type of effect on the economy. Um, it may be le less pronounced now because of disintermediation, and it may be because um, the economy is just a post-COVID economy that is one that is growing that is catch in a catch-up phase that will continue to, to move forward, unlike past uh, cycles. And so uh, we do expect... Uh, that we'll see some slowdown next year, but probably not a recession at this point. All right, an optimistic tone here to end uh, the conversation. Martin Schultz, always great to get your perspective. Federated Hermes, head of International Equity Group. Thanks. Thank you.